this mean it's not working? <laughs> Are we all ready? Yeah, they're ready. <laughs> they're warmed up? <laughs> well, I want to spend a little bit of time with uh, applications of gas chromatography, but also I wanted to make one point that, that maybe Pam already made to you, and maybe this is redundant. But we spend a lot of time worrying about things spreading out in a call. We make an injection. It's a nice, sharp injection. Everything's together. But then throughout, it's, it's going to spread. Those peaks are going to get fatter and fatter and fatter. So a lot of the effort we make is trying to keep those peaks skinny, keep them narrow, keep them together. If we keep them together, we resolve these two peaks very well. If we're getting spreading in the column, we get poor interactions, and they start, okay, getting broader peaks, maybe they look like this, or maybe they look like this. And so we do put a lot of effort trying to keep those peaks together, that compound, as they be loose through our columns. And that's why we look at thin, thin, you know, small diameter columns. Not as much difference in gas flow through a thin column as a fat column. We like nice thin layers on the inside of that column. So things interact on the surface, get out. They get out together. There's not a lot of options for going in, 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 out, 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 out. And so we spend a lot of time, like I say, trying to keep that as a, those peaks together, compounds together, in a short distance of the column. So uh, applications. <clears throat> got three applications. The uh, first one relates to my particular interest, biotechnology to produce natural flavor compounds. Uh, it's always fascinating to me. If a microbe makes something, it's natural. If we do an enzyme makes something, it's natural. If a human makes something, it's not natural. And you think, what's, what's the difference? <laughs> and so a lot of the effort goes into trying to get, in my business, trying to get nature to produce, well, not nature necessarily, but produce things in a natural manner. And fermentation's one of those. So what uh, this one looks at, fermentation of lake acid by a particular microorganism to produce delta decalactone. By the way, this compound costs about $1,300 a kilo by fermentation, by this process. I can buy it for about $40 a kilo if it's made by man. So every time you buy a natural flavor, keep in mind, you're paying a lot for to say natural to get essentially the same compound out of it. So it's fascinating. So we play a lot of silly games to get to live by the laws. How's that? And so we're interested in fermentation in this place because chiral composition of that lactone is extremely important. And so we have to have the right form. And we want the R form versus the, the S form. And that is done by microorganisms. It is done by enzymes more easily, typically, than, than people. And so very, very simple process done in the laboratory for uh, looking at optimizing growing conditions, optimizing yield, and so on. Do your culture medium, put the microorganism in there, your lake acid in there. Allow it to, to grow, extract with diethyl ether, ether. And it's five extracts at 40 mils each. So put 40 mils of ether in, shake the heck out of it, collect the ether. 
put another 40 mils in, shake the heck out of it, collect the ether. And so you keep on doing that five times, pool the ether, and then go ahead and concentrate. We use the silica gel fractionation next to get rid of a lot of the junk, in other words, other flavor compounds. <laughs> and so we do a rough fractionation first by column chromatography, and then we do an analysis by gas chromatography to see what we've done, so what have we, uh, we accomplished. The separation of, of chiral compounds has to be based on molecular shape. There's little difference in solubility, there's little difference in volatility, there's little difference in interactions, but there is a difference in shape of those molecules, and that's the main thing that we, we base it on. And so our particular column contains cyclodextrin. If you're familiar with cyclodextrins, there are five or six glucose units put together in a ring, and that center of the ring tends to be hydrophobic. You think glucose units, hydrophobic, well, if you put them in a ring and put them in water, the hydrophobic regions, carbon, hydrogen, want to come together. So you've got a hydrophobic center. And on the outside, you have all your hydroxy groups for that glucose. But it does have a ring, and it's a certain size. It's hydrophobic. Flavor compounds love to be in there if they fit. And if better they fit, the longer they stay there. And so we take advantage of shape of a molecule to do our separation. And what do we get out of this? So we've got uh, the saturated delta decalactone, a non-saturated version, but we have the R and the S forms of various isomers. And you get some really nice, uh, nice separation in that manner. It's about the only way we can separate these things is taking advantage of that type of a column. So we monitor our production of a flavor compound and the chiral form of that flavor compound by gas chromatography. This is a, an easy one. Of course, it's apple time <laughs> in Minnesota. And so apples are typically treated with a diphenylamine. Treat apples prior to storage to control apple scald. And the apples are dipped in a solution of one gram per kilogram. Um, Okay, and there, of course there is a residue on the surface. The FDA really doesn't like to see uh, a residue or significant residue, let's put it that way, so they kind of keep track of this. How much of this is left on the surface? Think of that next time you eat the apple without washing it, okay? <laughs> they permit 10 parts, 10 parts per million. So how do you analyze for that? This is an easy one, I love it, go ahead. I think it's, I don't think it's a softening. I think it's a surface phenomenon. Okay. And again, I'll have to go home back and Google it. <laughs> um, and so in this case, you're looking for just what's on the surface. So literally, you toss the, the apple <laughs> into hexane or apples into hexane, and you concentrate uh, for to, to get a better concentration. So you tend to evaporate that off, uh, uh, evaporate solvent, it could be uh, hexane, okay, so you concentrate that hexane. Diphenylamine isn't very volatile, so it's going to stay in the solution as you concentrate it. And then do gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Why mass spectrometry? Because this is the surface of your apple. <laughs> yeah, think of that next time you have your apple. <laughs> and which one of those are diphenylamine? And you understand it's going to be something that's very, very tiny. So how do we find it? How do we quantify it? How do we measure in the presence of all these other things? The simplest way is to put a mass spectrometer at the end of that gas chromatograph, and everything that comes off that gas chromatograph is analyzed by mass spectrometry. So this is the mass spectrum. Basically, remember I said about mass spectrometry? We take molecules. We hit them with high energy, we blow them to bits, and we pick up the pieces and count up those pieces. So these are the pieces of this diphenylamine. Here's a piece at 50, mass of 51. So it does it on the basis of molecular size of that piece. And this is the number of pieces that have a mass of 51, a mass of 77, a mass of 160. I think that's one should be nine, one should be 69. And so we can then say this is our compound of interest. Let's look through a whole mess of things and see what compounds coming out have a piece, of, a, a fragment, as it's blown up, of mass 169. 
So now the instrument's set up and said, okay, I'm only going to look for things that blow into pieces of 169 molecular weight. And we're going along, here's time, looting from the gas paragraph, nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, here's something at 169. Ah, but wouldn't you know, it's not my compound. If I look at all the other pieces, that's not it. We come along, come along, ah, here it is. This has the right spectrum. And by the way, if I inject a little pure compound, I find out it comes out about 17.5 minutes. So at the right time, we have the right mass. And we spiked it, so we got a bigger peak. So OK, that's it. Now here's one without being spiked. This is a true apple. And we kind of look at this gas chromatographic run, and there it is. And we can quantify based on the relative amounts how much was in here, how much is in here. We can then quantify how much of this compound's present. And of course, you always got to run, run a blank for your system. You don't know what's in that system. Left over from the night before, things have accumulated, the last person ran the machine, so there's always a, always a blank. Selected ion monitoring. So I am looking. These are ions. These are all positively charged bits and pieces that we're, we're looking at here. And so we're selecting certain ions and we're measuring them as, you know, as they come out of a gas chromatograph. So we're looking for that ion at 169. So you've done this one. At this point, probably all of you have done it, but you probably haven't gotten all your data yet. or. Sound about, about right? Okay. And so you're interested in fatty acid profile. And you know, you're interested in fatty acid profile for adulteration. Are you you're paying a price for virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, or some other you know unique oil today? And you want to know, am I am I buying what I think I'm buying? And one way to look at that oil is look at the fatty acid profile. You may be interested in someone identifying. You may be interested in quantifying. You make a label claim. So much unsaturated fatty acids. So much saturated fat in your food. That's on a label claim. And so how do you determine that? By gas chromatography, a very simple methodology. And you, of course, isolated uh, the fat. I, you didn't isolate it, did you? You were given pure oils to, to analyze. Otherwise, you'd have to look at some other methodology. Have you done Soxlet yet? Nope. Coming up. OK, you're going to collect fat from the Soxlet. So if you wanted to know the fatty acid profile of some food, some grain, some whatever, you'd have to extract that fat, typically by a solvent extract, a Soxlet extract. And you take that, and you carry it just like you did as a pure oil. So you have to extract that oil, and then you can carry out the same procedure as, as you've done. And this should be the procedure pretty well that you've, you've gone through for this. You've gone ahead and taken boron trifluoride, put a couple drops of fat. It would probably be better if that was a little more accurate than <laughs> a couple drops. There can be quite a bit of variation there. Uh, you put a cover on it. You put it in boiling water for one hour. Cool and add three mils of distilled water. And so what that does, and adding hexane, so you add three mils of water, 10 mils of hexane, your fatty acids now become oil soluble, soluble in hexane. So when you when you split them off the triglyceride and you esterify them with this ester, they now become soluble in hexane. You collect that top fraction, you concentrate it a little bit, and then you inject it into a gas chromatograph. So those are the steps you you should have gone through. You could have gotten a chromatogram that would look something like this. This happens to be standards, so you're probably not going to see exactly this in, t in terms of amounts. But the, the neat thing about gas chromatography is the time to elution. How long before this compound elutes comes out of the column? Well, it actually comes out at 1.769 minutes. And what is that methyl ester? It's butyric acid, so it's methyl butyrate. Your next one out here is two more carbons up. So ethyl butyrate, ethyl caproate, which is six carbons, eight carbons, 10 carbon acid, 12, 14, 16. And here's then our C18, steric, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic. And again, you can just go right down these retention times. And the next time you inject this, that's going to come off right there. I mean, if you don't change any of your conditions, a compound will butyric acid 
methyl ester, will always come off at that time. It may vary by a hundredth of a minute. How's that? But it's not going to go much beyond a hundredth of a minute. It's remarkably consistent. And that helps you. So when you run your unknown, you look and say, okay, what time did my compound come off? And at 14038, you're going to say if there's a peak there, it's palmitic acid that you're measuring. So retention time's remarkably reliable, reproducible. You've probably got something that looks more like, more like this. Uh, where do we find butyric acid, caproic acid? Uh, but can you think of a fat that has a fair amount of those two fatty acids in our food supply? What's that? <laughs> Oh, no. Butter, dairy, mammalian milk, you bet. Anytime you find butyric acid, you find some of these small short-chain ones, they will come from dairy sources, mammalian milk. If you were, of course, running this and nothing else happens until you get out about C12, which must be about here, and you get a nice peak at C12 and then the rest, you're looking at coconut. And so you could look at that profile and have a pretty good idea. Oh, this is a plant source. This is an animal source. Uh, this is a certain type of plant. So you'll get something that looks like this. And again, you can take those times and go ahead and compare them to the standards. You should have a, a standard gas schematogram, I think, or times given to you, let's hope. And then by looking, you know, comparing two standards, here are the standards, here is your sample. You can say, okay, that's palmitic acid, that's steric, oleic, linoleic, and there's no linolenic in this sample. So basically that's the task you're, you're going through. And you're looking at the percentage, I believe. I don't know if you're doing absolute amounts. Typically you look at percentage profile. In a typical fat, there'll be a certain percent of fatty acids. That's this one, a certain percent, that's another one, and so on. And so your instrument may or may not be set up to read directly a percentage. In this particular sample, it's 25% palmitic, 18.7% steric. Uh, it's essentially 41% ole oleic and 14.7% linoleic. So you will get an area printout that gives you percent composition that you compare with tables and get identifications. This is uh, pretty much the, the same. These, uh, these compounds, um, and <laughs> Pam, would you like to find the next presentation? Okay. Um, th these data are, are really pretty accurate. We're kind of assuming all of these fatty acids respond the same in the instrument. And they, they're close. They respond to carbon-hydrogen bonds. If you put some oxygen, you put some other things in there, it messes you up a little bit. So butyric acid won't give you quite as much response as steric does. Steric got all kinds of carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and so on. Butyric has only three of them, or four carbons. And then it's got an oxidized group at the end. So we tend to just kind of slough it off and say they're all the same. Um, they aren't, but they're close enough. How's, how's that? <laughs> that we don't tend to worry about it too much. So. That's gas chromatography. Anybody have any burning questions? They stayed awake all last night wondering uh, about waiting to, to ask. I guess, okay. <laughs> I never do get much of a response to that. You always, you always give them the opportunity. <laughs> I guess they don't lay awake worrying about it. Anyway, so, so let's go on. You've got bigger things to worry about, perhaps. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go on to mass spectrometry. I, I've alluded to that, I've talked about it a little bit, but let's, let's give you a little more background on this uh, instrument. What do we use it for? Well, a major use is identification of unknowns. There, there's really no other technique that gives you as much information with as much sensitivity in when we try to identify a compound. Assuming they're fairly small molecules, you know, maybe under a few hundred molecular weight. You know, blowing things into pieces and looking how they explode in pieces, you can put them together and do a really good job. And they can be useful at nanograms or femtogram levels. 
as I maybe I mentioned, um, maybe that was a different different lecture, but I had a student that worked over a year collecting materials for NMR to get enough material to actually analyze a compound by NMR. And so you really don't want to spend a year trying to isolate enough of something to identify it. And so that's, again, where mass spectrometry shines. Really good sensitivity, really good amount of, of information. So identifying unknowns. That's also to quantify. And that's what I was just giving you an example of, quantifying compounds. You don't even have to separate them in order to quantify. And you don't have to separate one compound from another. You couldn't, you know, just dump a mess in. You do have to do your best job of separation. Um, but it's really useful for quantifying how much of something is there. Elucidate the structure, chemical properties. That's kind of in the same, same category. But again, if you do this for a living, you start looking at those pieces and say, gosh, this blew into these pieces, and that only comes from an alcohol function. There must have been a carbonyl group in there. It must have been an alcohol group. But that comes with a, a good deal of a good deal of practice. And there is a, a pretty good website for this and a tutorial. So worthwhile taking a look at, again, if you want something to do. <laughs> so applications are almost like gas chromatography. I, I think we have actually do a little better when we look at mass spectrometry in terms of applications. Uh, detect and identify uh, steroids and athletes. Okay, you want to know who does that drug testing at the Olympics? Well, it's a mass spectrometry laboratory. Monitor the breath of patients during anesthesiology. By when you're put to sleep for a surgery, whatever, they're monitoring your effluent, your metabolism. What is flowing in your bloodstream that's expressed through your lungs? How much of the anesthetic is present in the body? Determine molecules found in space. Okay, that sounds, sounds like fun. Determine whether honey is adulterated with corn syrup. That's getting rather mundane after these other ones, but we do lose sleep over it. Honey is expensive. Corn syrup, pretty cheap. We'd like to pay for what we, you know, what we want. Locate oil deposits in, out in exploring for oil. Monitor fermentation processes for the biotechnology. Detect uh, dioxins and contaminated fish, so pollution. Gene damage from environmental causes. Elemental composition of semiconductors. These remember if horses are given cobra toxins to kill the pain so they run faster and they don't happen to notice that that hurts. <laughs> you know, I mean, take your pick. We could go on page after page with applications. They're even used for taking pictures. How's that? Which is really, really fascinating. So. It's a fascinating technique with a great deal of application in our field and certainly in other fields. And as I said, why is it so popular? Think about that. The information you get at 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 15 grams of compound. You might say, why don't we just use more? Well, you know, the example of trying to get enough for NMR, my student had to work a long time to get enough for NMR was easy. He could get a spectrum pretty easy at compound. But he had to collect thousands, literally thousands, of runs and pool them to get enough for NMR. So it is really sensitive. There's a lot of structural information. And like I say, we can really look, select a compound that we want to analyze for in a mess. And so marvelous technique. These are the pieces of a mass spectrometer. We've got a have some way to get our samples into the system. The system runs under vacuum. It'll be 10 to the minus sixth uh, tor millimeters of mercury. 10 to the minus sixth, 10 to the minus seventh, you're even happier. A uh, pretty decent vacuum when it comes right down to it. How are we going to get a sample? Open the door and put it in? <laughs> Not really. So we've got to have an inlet for this system. A source, our source is where we get these ions, a fragment. This molecule comes in. Here's where we blow it up. <laughs> okay, So we blow it up at that point. And then we selectively take, in most cases, the positive bits and pieces. We blow it into many compounds, ions, negatively charged, positively charged, neutrally charged. We tend to drag the positively charged out. Then we have to separate those positively charged fragments. And that's the analyzer. So we start looking how many fragments are there of mass 30? How many are mass 31? How many mass 32? you know, all the way up the, the chain. 
So we do our separation here, and we do our quantification here. Finally, of course, we quantify the, the amounts of each of these fragments, and it goes down to the data system and gives you a nice, neat little, little printout. A great deal of things have happened during that time between, you know, there and down here. I'm going to start and go through these pieces kind of one by one to give you a little bit of appreciation of what they are and how they function. And we're going to start with electron impact. So I want to use a source that depends upon electron impact to make it blow into bits. So let's start with that. It is our, probably our oldest method of ionization. It's one of our most useful methods of ionization. Pure compound, if uh, <laughs> ideally, you like to have one pure compound come into the mass spectrometer time. It does make life easier. But we don't always get that situation. So we, we may be putting in more than one compound at a time. It may be a mixture. And literally, if it's a fairly pure compound, we might be able to kind of have a vacuum lock. So we shut off the vacuum. We take out a little glass probe. We put a drop of material, a microgram, a nanogram, a femtogram <laughs> on the end of this little probe and push it back into the instrument and uh, bombard what was in that little glass tube. I just loaded it up. It's called a direct probe. I'm putting a direct probe directly into our ion source. And of course, gas chromatography is a nice way to feed compounds in. Uh, HPLC is a nice way to, to get, get compounds in. What happens is, though, this compound that's put in by one of these techniques gets hit with high energy electrons. There's 70 electron volts. That greatly exceeds the bond energies that we have between carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen in an atom or in a molecule, I should say, whoops. And so we put just a great deal of energy in. It just can't manage it. It blows to pieces. And so this is kind of how it works from a mechanic standpoint. Here's our sample coming in. That could be our gas schematographic uh, effluent. It could be liquid schematographic effluent. It's coming in, and it's coming in, and it's getting into a vacuum. So it kind of vaporizes, it tends to kind of move across. Right here, we have a rubidium filament. And so we put a current, electrical current, on this rubidium filament. And it starts giving off electrons. And those electrons tend to be drug up towards this positive collector. So there's a positively charged collector here that's dragging those electrons across the path of our compound as it comes in. And so our compounds will be hit by these electrons. They'll absorb that energy and blow into pieces. Some of them will be neutral, no charge. Some will be negative. Some will be positive. So all kinds of different fragments. We have a focusing lens here. And these are all negatively charged. So they then start dragging these out. They're going to pull our positively charged pieces. They're going to accelerate them in this manner. And then they get drug into our analyzer. The molecule does fragment at its weak points. It's kind of neat that the molecule always does break up in the same way. The weak bonds are always a weak bonds in a molecule. And so the pieces you get are reproducible. They're always reproducible. If you hit a molecule with 70 electron volts, it's going to fragment into this pattern of pieces. So what you get at that point, we're taking our positive ions, separating and measuring them, get a complex fragmentation pattern like I showed you on the board where we got a masses of different, well, different masses. And then we measure specific ions and compare them to databases. Again, if you do it, you do this for a living, you don't necessarily need the database. You look at the fragmentation pattern, you say, that can only come from. But that, like I say, you've lived the mass spectrometry to do that. Our normal pathway is to use a database. And again, there's where the computer goes to work. In the end, I'll tell you some of the dangers that are coming into, to be, you know, depending upon this database. How's that? It'll always give you an answer, right or wrong. So we'll talk about when it's wrong. So the positive ion of the unfragmented molecule is called a parent ion. So 
I say it'll always break into pieces. There'll be a certain distribution. There's a chance that some just of the intact molecule will just pick up a positive charge. You get an electron just knocked off it. You kind of get the distribution of pieces. And so if you're fortunate, you actually get some of your molecule intact, not fragmented, but has a positively charge. Why do we like to see that? We'd love to see it because then we got a molecular weight. I know the molecular weight of my compound. That helps me in my identification. We call that the parent ion. It is the parent. It is the parent molecule. It's intact molecule with a positive charge. The base peak or base ion is the most abundant fragment, the most abundant piece that's formed. And we use those terms. Uh, what's the parent ion? Good, I had no molecular weight. What's the largest fragment? In the, the diphenylamine, it was the 169. That was the largest component in that fragmentation pattern. Kind of simple, probably should look for something a little more complex than carbon dioxide, how's that? <laughs> but this is the mass spectrum of carbon dioxide. And here is our parent compound. The molecular weight of CO2 is 44, right? So we got one carbon, which is a mass of 12. We got two oxygens, each of them is 16. Two of them 16 is 32, plus 12 is 44. So that's our, our parent ion. And by mass spectrometry, that's a fairly stable piece. So I know right away it's 44. That really limits <laughs> options at that point. I say it blows it to bits. Well, yeah. okay, maybe I have to qualify that. It largely blows it into bits. Some of them don't but, but some of them don't fragment very, no. They don't get blown to bits very well. And I'll show you some problems where some bonds are so weak, you never see this. So it really depends on the molecule, how cohesive, how strong are those bonds. So is it consistent? It is consistent, and it's always consistent. So you always have It will always have this fragmentation pattern. You know, the, the biggest ion is going to be the parent itself. There's going to be carbon monoxide, so it's lost one oxygen. Here's that lost oxygen, and here's the carbon that was attached to it. But that pattern will always be the same. As long as I stay with this, the energy, the 70 electron volts. If I start messing around with that, then it's not going to have the same, same pattern. The nice thing about electron impact is it is a good fragmentation pattern. It does blow into a lot of pieces. And that, that may sound a little bit odd. That's good? Well, it is good because then they got a lot of pieces to figure what was there before. If there's no pieces, I've got a mass of 44. Well, wait a minute. I don't have anything to look at. What was it built up from? So that helps you that it has have a good fragmentation pattern. Lots of pieces to understand put together. The disadvantage is you may not see that parent ion. I got a good example of that. And it also it may lack sensitivity, and that can be a little bit of an issue. Because we're generating all kinds of ions. If it only generates one ion, then I got lots of one ion. But here I have a little bit of lots of ions. So it's worse to have a little bit of lots of ions than it is to have a nice big one to look for. <laughs> so if that didn't make sense, that's OK. <laughs> Ask me if it, if it bothers you when <laughs> you lay awake at night. So here's the, here's the example. No molecular ion. That way I don't have a mass to work from. And what is this? This is ephedrine. So ephedrine, this is the molecule ephedrine. I put it into my mass spectrometer. I blow it into bits. That bond right here between is so weak. It's being drawn by the benzene ring. It's being drawn by the oxygen. We've got a nitrogen out here pulling on the electrons of that bond. And so when it gets hit by energy, there's just none of this that survives because that's so darn weak. So what's our mass spectrum? It's almost just a mass of 58. That's about all we see. I'm looking at positive fragments. And to say it's mass of 58, you kind of look and scratch your head. Man, it could be thousands of things that have a mass of 58. So it doesn't help as much as you'd like to see. How do we get around uh, some of our problems? Well, we use a different type of source. We use a chemical ionization source. So I'm not going to be hitting my compound of high energy electrons. What I'm going to do is I'm going to feed in what we call a reagent gas 
into the system. And that reagent gas is going to be ionized itself. So it's going to have a charge. And that reagent gas could be methane, isobutane, or ammonia. And so what would you do is we put this reagent gas in that's ionized. It comes together with our compounds we analyze. And the reagent gas ionizes our sample. It transfers its charge. So reagent gas gets charged. It transfers its charge and energy to our molecules we're looking for. In this case, um, we have really better sensitivity because one ion, typically, not a whole bunch of pieces, it's low energy. It doesn't blow it to many pieces. So it's only a small number of pieces. So advantages, a little better sensitivity. A disadvantage, not as many fragments to try to piece together. So this is our ephedrine again. So when we did this by electron impact, we saw, of course, our fragment here. If we do it by chemical ionization, we actually get our compound here, our molecular weight of our compound. The interesting thing is our molecular weights, all of our fragments, are one mass bigger than they really are because they take a hydrogen from that reagent gas. So they transfer hydrogen off the reagent gas to your molecules. So this is molecular weight of ephedrine is 185, but the mass and mass spectrometers it measures here is 186. It picked up the hydrogen from our reagent gas. So we break off here. We break off an oxygen hydrogen, take it down 17. Here's a fragment. So it's a, a fragment or some a whole thing together. There's a fragment down here, and we find other fragments in here as we go, go down. So Using chemical ionization gives us a different pattern, a different profile, different information, and but typically better sensitivity. Lots of different choices for uh, ionizing samples. Um, you can kind of read, read through these. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time with some of them, so we'll, we'll selectively look at some of them. But there's many ways to do this, uh, to get these ions in and get them blown apart. How's that? Um, Maldi. Anybody heard of Maldi? Okay. Uh, oftentimes it's a Maldi Toff. <laughs> Not a Molotov, but a Maldi Toff. <laughs> Gotta get it right yet. Uh, a Maldi Toff. And the, the Toff, is there's a Toff on the end, it's a certain type of mass um, analyzer. We'll, we'll see that later on. So application, high molecular weight analytes, analysis of proteins, peptides, glycoproteins, oligosaccharides, oligonucleotides. So it's good for large molecules. The process, a sample is pre-mixed with a highly absorbing, I mean energy absorbing. If I hit it with a laser, it's going to absorb a lot of the laser energy. That matrix that is mixed with, so your sample gets mixed into a matrix. And literally, you hit it with a laser, and it pretty well blows your matrix up. How's that? The matrix transforms the latest energy into excitation energy. It's sputtered in the analyte. You form ions on the surface of your, your sample, your mixture. Analyte's ionized with little decomposition, so there's not much fragmentation. You tend to get uh, a spectrum that is more the intact compound. The, the, and this shows an example. Here's your matrix with your analytes in. Not a really good example. This basically should be blowing this out in one way or another. So separating it from that matrix, which then you go ahead and, and analyze. This is a, just a little different view of it. For you. Here's your sample in your sample matrix. Hit with the laser, vaporizes that <coughs> matrix, expels ions that get drawn down and separated and detected. Little fragmentations, so it's a, a gentle means of doing this ionization. A downfall of it is that it's one charge per unit compound or intact molecule. And I'll, I'll say, well, I guess I've got that. What's the advantage of having one charge per molecule? If it's a big molecule, that's not much charge to be dragging out and separating. We'd like to have maybe many charges on there. So if we put an electric field, it gets drug out quickly or specifically. So the idea of one charge to mass limits the molecular weight. It just won't drag big molecules out 
and get them analyzed. And so this is a, a typical uh, spectrum of this. Here's your matrix, and here's your analyte. That's a, a protein, I believe, of mass 2,466.7. But not much for fragmentation here. But we can't get 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. Ben? That gets to be a problem, uh, but the, they've, they've done well along those lines. Typically on a protein, you'll put it through a preliminary uh, process of treatment, so you, you tend to fragment that protein. Then you look at all the fragments, you can figure out how they're put together. But at least that's, that's one approach to it. And so you, you figure out bits and pieces and then assemble it. Fast atom bombardment, a little similar methodology, how's that? Bombardment of this analyte, which you want to measure, with a matrix, and use a particle beam instead of a laser. It's just another way to kind of vaporizing that, that matrix. Matrix might be a glycerol or 3-nitrobenzene, I'm sorry, nitrobenzyl <coughs> alcohol. The beam is a neutral inert gas, typically argon or xenon. So we're bombarding it not with a laser, but a different Actually, a fast atom, how about that? <laughs> you get a good mobility to the argon or xeon, and you will get a high collision energy. A collision energy tends to vaporize your matrix. This is a, more or less a picture of that. So the idea that here's your atom beam, the argon or xeon coming in. It is ionized. It hits your, your sample here. There will be a collision energy. Energy is given off. We're going to have a negatively charge up here, so we're going to draw those positive fragments this way. There's nothing really dragging these negatively charged fragments or neutral fragments, so they go out with the vacuum pump. They get just kind of pumped out of the system because you're really only interested, in most cases, for these positive fragments that you're looking at. This, this gets to be more fun, DESI. Um, I direct ion electrospray ionization sources. I like it a great deal because it's simple. I like simple things. I have a simple mind. The simpler it is, the happier I am, honestly. And so this is, this is so good. So, <laughs> okay, I'm getting overly excited. So we have a solvent coming in here, nitrogen gas. This is highly charged. This would be several hundred volts, or thousands of volts, actually. And so what you get as a solvent is, is ionized. And those ions are bombarded. They hit the surface of the sample, and they'll tend to knock some compounds out. They ionize them and knock them out. And so, the, you know, it's the angle here. And they get collected here, and you do mass spectrometry of it. So you look at what fragments you're picking up here. And so there's no sample preparation. That's the part I like so much. You put the sample underneath this probe, and it sputters out and gives you ions, and they bounce off, and you've got something, something to measure. This is a, an example of it. You want to know what's on the surface of that tomato. It should be an apple, right? Then we'd have a can, <laughs> we could be looking for diphenylamine. Uh, so you just put a product there, and knocks off ions, makes ions here. They get bounced off and, and collected over there. So very, very simple technique. Uh, DART is a different one, and you've, you're all familiar with DART, I expect, aren't you? Is anybody not familiar with DART? Really? You've never gone to the airport? You've never been uh, taken aside and said, uh, let's check you out. Uh, we want to swab your palms, swab your luggage. So you, you may be more familiar with DART than you think. What they're doing is they're, they're taking a quick MS of that swab. And so, what you do is, again, you put that swab, in that case, right down in front of this ion source. So you, know, so you just have a different way of ionization. It ionizes what's ever on that source, and then that looks for you know, explosive uh, fragments. So it's a, we, we are all are familiar with it. It's a real quick, a very simple methodology. I'm more interested in cheese. I'm in, more interested in composition of food products. Can I just take a cheese? Can I take something, put it under there, and get a composition? you know, in seconds. Neat. Can you ask a question? Can you do that with something else, or is it only your probe for this specific? 
It, it has a lot of application. Uh, we didn't get anywhere looking for a cheese, <laughs> which disappointed me because I wanted to look for bitter compounds. Is my cheese bitter? And if you could just take a piece of cheese, put it under, and have it look specifically for the mass of the bitter compounds, we could very quickly determine bitterness. And it didn't get anywhere. Maybe the problem, part of the problem was I didn't have any money to do it. And so when you go up and say, well, wouldn't you guys like to run this for me? Not really. <laughs> do you have a budget number? Uh, no. I'm a good friend. I play racquetball with the guy who runs the place. Does that help? No. <laughs> so, so anyway, you pull everything you can. And I didn't get enough to show promise. But I, I think it's, it has a fascinating potential to do that, to look for things very, very quickly, very rap easily, too. So that's, um, gosh, that's all the ways of getting, well, it's not all the ways, but it's many of the most common ways of getting a sample and blowing it to pieces or ionizing it. That's so many different approaches. Now we got all these pieces. We're going to drag normally the positive ones in. We can drag the negative pieces in, but we you don't usually do that. So we're going to drag all these pieces together as one lump, and we're going to have to separate them. So I want to separate all those pieces by molecular weight. And so magnetic sectors, one method, quadrupole, ion trap, time of flight. And we'll say, what, what's in the future? We've had some, some neat things happen here. Uh, magnetic sector was the first instrument that was uh, ever done. And again, all of you know the right-hand thumb rule from physics, right? That an electrical a particle moving through a magnetic field, and you put it that way, and the field's going this way, and it pushes the force that, oh, never mind. Anyway, it works. It, it works in that sense. So we get our positive. I'm not sure if I was pointing in the right direction anyway. <laughs> okay, I'm having too much fun. So anyway, so we have positive, we have all these positive pieces, and we're dragging them into this magnetic field. If that magnetic field is very low, only those lightest molecules will actually be bent around and come out in the right place here, pass through here to be identified. Anything that's bigger won't be bent enough, and it's going to be colliding. So we start increasing the magnetic field. And so maybe initially I bend a mass to 12 around here, a little more magnet. I bend mass 13, so mass is 13, comes through here and gets measured 14, 15, 100, 100, whatever. So by changing the magnetic field, you change the focus of what you're measuring. And so it's a very, very old technique. It's a, a very good technique. The problem is it's a little bit slow for us today. That uh, magnet weighs several hundred pounds. They have to have a strong magnetic field. And what you find is it takes time to charge that magnet and dispel it, charge it, you know, and then let it relax. So it's not very fast. It's really good, but it's not very fast. And that doesn't meet some of our needs today. This uh, was actually our first detector. It even preceded the other one. And that's where we ionize the sample. And then we say, how long is it going to take for that, each of those pieces to go a certain distance and get measured? And again, you probably remember from physics someplace, kinetic energy. That your kinetic energy equals 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. And you're saying, of course. OK. And so what you'll find is you get all, all of these pieces get the same kinetic energy. So they differ in speed. If they all have the same kinetic energy, if they're bigger mass, they move slower. If they're smaller mass, they move faster. So you do a pulse, and then you measure the nanoseconds to get down here. And you can then say, the ions that got down here in so many nanoseconds is a mass of 12. Mass of 13 was a little slower. So by timing, you can measure how much of, or let's say, the molecular weight of those pieces. Quadrupole um, is beyond my understanding. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I was doing pretty good in the first couple. When it gets down to here. What's the, oh, <laughs> I am? <laughs> they are. They are. OK, well, consider it magic. And so you've, you've <laughs> I hope you're going to count that as correct. <laughs> no? OK. So you've got the quadrupoles, four poles. And they have both an electric field on them, a variable electric field. As much as I know about it, so we're going to be actually putting these ions into this electric field. 
And by varying the uh, frequency power on these poles, we will selectively have one mass make it through and then another mass and another mass. So you just kind of focus by changing the electric, electromagnetic field on those poles. And that's, that's good. And I'm even less knowledgeable of the ion trap. So how's that? The ion trap simply collects ions of a certain mass and then dumps them and gets measuring. Then it collects another mass, dumps them and measures them and so on. Um, fortunately, we don't see many of those around, so I don't have to explain them. So anyway, let's, uh, let's call it quits at this point. Um, thank you. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>